29 years ago, who could have imagined what God was planning? 200 million shoeboxes. That's right, in 29 years, 200 million shoebox gifts going to children around the world in Jesus' name. You see, we want the children of the world to know that God loves them and that Jesus Christ came from heaven to this earth to take our sins, that he died and shed his blood on the cross for the sins of mankind. We want the children of the world to know that they're special to him. And every shoebox is an opportunity for us to share God's love with children around the world. And this year, this is a, a symbolic box, the 200 million, and uh, it's been packed by some special friends. And, uh, and I'm adding my gift, and I'm adding a, a lamb. And this lamb uh, reminds me a little bit of a lamb that my mother gave me when I was a young boy. She thought I was the black sheep of the family. And so she had a black lamb that played Jesus Loves Me. But this box right here is going to go to a girl in Ukraine. This year, we're going to do a special distribution there. The children there are suffering so much. It's cold, snowy, and so many of the buildings don't have heat, don't have electricity. So we're going to go in Jesus' name to the children of Ukraine. And we thank you for your prayers. We thank you for your support. Uh, 200 million boxes. Who could have imagined? Look what God has done. God bless you. Twenty-nine years. My name is Yekaterina Hazelden, and I'm from the former Soviet Union. I grew up in a poor and dysfunctional family. After my father went to prison, my mother left and she never came back. My sister and I, we were left to fend for ourselves. We kept wandering the streets until we were put into an orphanage. Some orphanages were nice. Others, teachers were mentally and physically abusive. In the year of 2000, missionaries began to enter my orphanage. They told us how I can pray to God anytime and he would hear me. And one of those missionaries was Operation Christmas Child. I still remember the day I received my shoebox. It was a beautiful sunny day. As I began to open my shoebox, I discovered a coloring book uh, and markers. I was 12 years old and I was just so excited about those items because I love to color. I began to hope for a family that would come and take me in as their own into their family. Years went by and no one seemed to be interested. I began to give up on God. Until one day a social worker called me over and said, girls, I don't know how, but both of you are getting adopted and you are going to America. In that moment, I knew with God, all things are possible. God not only blessed me with good Christian parents, but he also blessed me with loving husband, two children, and we enjoy packing shoeboxes as a family. Those simple shoeboxes bring so much hope and joy to the children around the world, like me, in Jesus' mighty name. My name is Kreshnik Jahaya, and I come from southeastern Europe. I was six years old during the war in Kosovo, which left a lot of people very poor. The place was just devastated. It was the, the houses were burned, the schools were, were destroyed. There was a lot of um, pain and poverty. My family decided to stay in Kosovo during the whole time to shelter from one place to another. We would try to sleep in my mother's lap with the whole neighborhood in, in one basement. So it was, it was tight, it was uh, hot, no room to play, no room to move, loud to the point where we couldn't sleep, we couldn't rest. A couple years after, we had this really cool group of people come in to our school. These people came with their smiles and they came with, with a light heart. It was Christmas time. We heard the story of Joseph, and Mary and how Jesus was born. I got lost in the story because it reminded me as a six-year-old in the basements when we were trying to shelter. 
it was just that parallel of, of how Jesus never had a place to be born, and they had to put him in a manger, find whatever means they can to, for him to be born. I related to that, and I wanted to know more. I was curious. Then we, we lined up, we got our boxes. It was the best day of my life. I had never received something that was my own. Together with the box, there was a pamphlet, and it came from the church for a kids' ministry. I was more curious, and it just kept building and building. About 10 years old, I decided to give my life to, to Jesus. I grew up to lead that ministry, and I believe to this day that whoever put that box together prayed about that and prayed for an eight-year-old boy somewhere in the world to receive, and it will come to know Jesus. Well, that's, that's what happened. An eight-year-old boy received a gift and changed his life forever. sure when it ended um, we have our our shoe boxes here um, if you look at the table over here um, I don't think we've set a goal for how many boxes we we want to get it get together we used to we had we've done that in the past we we've not for probably all those boxes if we could fill all those boxes that'd be great um, that'd, be, that'd be a good idea um, inside each uh, each box you'll find a list of of things that it's kind of a what to do list, a shoebox gift suggestions uh, for a girl or a boy. If you decide to fill out, do the girls or the boys, it says things to include and things not to include, um, candies, things like that, not to include. But it it has a list here, also, and it has a coloring sheet um, that some a kid can color, you can color, and you fill it out, and it, and it gives you it gives it's something kind of personal from you um, to give to them, and that way the kids. Uh, get to know, um, get to know the people that, that sent their box and the people that are praying for them. Also, whenever you get done on the front of your box, where it says "Place, uh, place your boy or girl label here," uh, take the label here and mark it "boy or girl." And also, it's between you can you can fill this box for a two to four year old, a five to nine year old, or a ten to fourteen year old. So mark which age group it is. So if you'd like to do one of those, um, there's boxes over here. And uh, we'll try to get all those filled and get them sent out on the 19th, which is about two weeks away. On a Sunday night, we're going to come together and we're going to pray over all these boxes as they leave here so that they might touch some little life somewhere in the world. And uh, they might get to hear the name Jesus and they may get to know Christ. And uh, that's, that's really the goal because a great gift was given to us that we're going to celebrate on the 25th of December. And it's not the gift of a new truck or a new pair of pants or clothes is the gift of Jesus. And uh, people, you hear people say, well, that's not really what he came. Well, listen, all I know is we're just celebrating it that day. We just picked that day to be ours. So um, be in prayer about that. Also, um, um, there's youth night at Hoboken Baptist Church. Meet there at 545. Is that tonight? Where's James? Is that tonight, Johnny? That's tonight, okay. As a youth night at Hoboken Baptist Church, meet there at 545. Um, also, the, there's a the great giveaway we have here at the church a couple times a year. There's a meeting today at 4 o'clock. For those of you involved in the great giveaway, um, I think you know who you are if you'd like to be. Um, be here at the church at 5, I'm, I'm sorry, at 4 o'clock. There's other people that's going to be involved this year. So everybody, please come and give a... Um, Johnny will be here for that. There's several people this morning that are going to see uh, Ridge uh, get baptized. Uh, Trina's little boy Ridge is getting baptized over at Southside today. So pray for them today and proud of Ridge. Be in prayer for a music director here at the church. Also, we still need volunteers for Children's Church. Um, November the 15th will be our Thanksgiving meal. Um, not this coming Wednesday, but next Wednesday night for, for Thanksgiving. Uh, prayer requests, remember Bryant Heyman. I think Bryant has an MRI tomorrow, so keep Bryant in your prayers. Um, Terry Hardy, remember Israel, Cameron Murray, Vance Wilson, Teresa Taylor, and our country. Any other prayer requests? Uh, Betty Mae Johns, she had a knee replacement. Betty Mae Johns. Mary Say it again. Mary Wayne Mary Wayne Wright's family.
Springfield Pond. Any others? I heard that. Remember Ashley. Any others? Terry Hayes. Terry Hayes. Any others? Mike Carter. Mike Carter? Clayton Carter. Mike Giddens. Mike Giddens. Lee Powell. Yes. What was Marty's last name? Gillett. Gillett. Any others? Any others? Brittany Deal. Brittany Deal. Pray for my mama. Uh, she had hip. She broke her hip sometime this past week. Um, they did surgery Friday. Um, she's coming home today, so I think Jonathan's bringing her home from the hospital today. Um, but uh, she's in good, good, good health. So thank the Lord for that. She's already up walking around. So appreciate all your prayers for her. Any others? Um, my brother Lamar is taking chemo uh, treatments for cancer, doing well. Uh, let's go back to work first first weekend, first day of December. So keep him in your prayers as well. Any others? Eddie May. Eddie. Eddie. Eddie May. Eddie May. Eddie unspoken? Amen. Let's lift each other up in prayer and pray, Lord, uh, lead us and guide us and direct us. Um, and uh, pray for those pray for those that are that are suffering this time of year. Christmas is coming up, and there's a lot of people um, that's lost loved ones this year. Um, that's lost loved ones in the past year or so that uh, that that are still has tough days during Thanksgiving and Christmas when we start the holiday season. So keep them in your prayers and lift them up as we pray. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together, for your love for us. We're thankful, God, that you care about us and that, you, Lord, you tell us to bring our cares to you and cast them on the altar. We thank you, God, that, that we can and that, that our people do. And, Lord, that you do answer prayers. I'm thankful, Lord, for, um, for Cameron Murray. I pray, Lord, you continue to bless him. Uh, I'm thankful, Lord, for Bryant. I just pray, God, for his test tomorrow. And just pray, Lord, you'll be, uh, you'll be there in the midst. I just pray, God, for a, a good outcome. We just we know God through all the love that we see outpoured through the people on our prayer list, God, that you hear our prayers, and we're thankful, Father. Help us to not grow weary in praying, to lift each other up, and to care and love for each other uh, in a way that, that shows your love. Uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would please stand and visit around just for a second.
Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him.
Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so eternally grateful, Lord, that uh, your word tells us that on one glorious day you'll come for us, Lord. Yes. Children, Lord. Amen. So yes. Amen. Thankful, Lord, that we have that to look forward to, Lord. Yes. I just pray that we will be that shining beacon in this dark world that, yes. that we could lead someone to, to you before it's eternity late, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your, this worship time. Thank you for these ladies that every Sunday bring us to worship, Lord. Lord, now we've come to the part of the service where we give back just a small portion of what you blessed us with. Go ahead and this tithe and offering, Lord. I just pray that you would bless it, bless the giver. Pray that we would use it in a manner that's worthy of your kingdom, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Sure, if there was a special alarm, so I was creeping up here. Hey, me at Children's Church, I see one going back there. He broke through. Okay, take your Bibles with me if you would. Turn to First Timothy. First Timothy. Um, in opening First Timothy, we find there's a, there's a problem in our churches, and not only the churches in these days. And and when Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, but it's a, I believe it's a. It's a letter that he wrote to Timothy that's still profound for us today um, about God's Word and knowing God's Word. I believe one of the biggest issues that we have in our churches today is a counterfeit Christianity. Uh, I, I don't know that people uh, sometimes even know, even know at times that what they have may or may not be a true salvation or true Christianity. There's a lot of people today um, uh, trusting in themselves for salvation. They're trusting in um, a day, a long time ago, um, instead, instead of the finished work of Christ. See, you, you, a person knows that they're saved because of the conversation they had with Jesus yesterday. Amen. You all right? Listen, if I, had to, if I had to just depend on August 29th, 1992, that's a long time ago. Yeah. But that's a long time ago. You know what brings me peace about my salvation? Yesterday. And Friday, and praying this, listen, and knowing at different times I can call on God and I see him answer prayers. Let's see, he's at work around me. That, that's, how I, that's how I come into full knowledge that I'm a, I'm a blood-washed, born-again child of the king. Now, I'm proud of August 29, 1992. Well, I'm glad I'm saved. I remember the day, I remember the time, I remember the place, the carpet, the little bench. I'll tell you about the little bench in there that we use as an altar is actually in my shop now. And I look at that little bench, and all it does is remind me of the day I gave my heart to Christ. Yes. But uh, that bench didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, uh, getting down on that carpet had nothing to do with it. It had everything to do with Jesus. Yes. And, and one thing that I think that we're, that, that, that's happening in our churches today is it's a, it's a growing problem of, of people not knowing what the Bible says. 
It's, it's a problem because people don't know where to go when they need help. And what's happening is, is people's coming up with their own ideas about what's right and what's wrong because there's no, no true north in Scripture. One of the reasons is, and I'm going to get into two or three different reasons, but one of our main reasons is today is people just, by and large, don't know Scripture. And we can call it people not going to Sunday school or people not going to this or that or whatever. But it's, it's people not in God's Word. People don't know what the book says. And, and if, we're, if we're true Christians, if we're truly Christian, then we want to know what our Heavenly Father requires of us. Amen. Listen, when I was a little boy growing up in Larry McMillan's household, um, I wanted to know what was required. Because if I got outside the rules of engagement uh, that we had there at the house, for how to live and how to act and how to do and how to, how to be, uh, it was punishment. Amen. So I wanted to know what the rules for engagement were at our household. There were th certain things you did, certain things you did not to do. Uh, uh, and, 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 and punishment was swift and consistent. You know, it was never, it was never you know, it, it was no negotiations. If you got a whipping for it last time, you got a whipping for it this time. And sometimes worse because you've already been told, you know, you, you know better. But I think, I think a lot of people today just by and large don't know what God's, God's Word says. Uh, George Gallup um, has a poll, you know, the Gallup poll. Um, he made this statement. He said, Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't, they don't read it. And because they don't read it, they've become a nation of biblical illiterates. They don't know what it says. They hear what people say. They hear what, they hear what these, these new age preachers say. They hear what these folks say, and, and, and they go along with it. And now you have, listen, uh, I, I'm not against anybody's Bible. I'm just for my King James Bible. I'll just be honest with you. I just like my Bible. But uh, listen, you, if we're not careful, we're going to get so far removed from what God intended for us to know about Scripture that, that it's going to be so, so messed up that, 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 that it just blows it. You ought to be able to get the truth in God's Word regularly, and, and you ought to be in it. Listen, I believe if you're a Christian, there's a part of you that wants to know God's Word, that wants to study, that wants to be in it. I can tell whenever I've missed God's Word, that, that, if, that if I'm drying up, and that's, that's biblical. I'm gonna look with me in 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'm going to jump off here before I preach all day. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, just keep your seats. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. I like Paul. I like because Paul is writing the books of the Bible. I like them old boys that had a second chance, don't you? Amen. Hey, I like them old boys that God looked at and said, ah, listen, I'm going to give you another chance. And a Paul was the worst of the worst, man. Listen, he thought he was doing it right. He, 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 was, he was just by the law, and he thought if I, could just, if I could live perfectly by the law, and I could do it by the law, then I'd be right. Can't none of us live the law. Amen. That's why Jesus came. And y'all, Listen, some of you better be glad Jesus came. Amen. Listen, because some of us don't even live by the law. Amen. <laughs> Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. He said, as I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, so thou mightest charge, listen to this, thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, meaning there was those teaching other doctrines. There was other people starting to preach other things. Paul basically said, he said, listen, I'm, I'm going to leave you and go to Macedonia. He said, but I won't even be past the last fence post before sheeps and wolves will be coming in here trying to teach you other things. They'll be trying to get into church, trying to change everything that I've said and everything that I've taught you, and they'll be trying to change the very words we learned from Jesus Christ into a lie. They'll be doing something different. He said, they'll be here. So he said, I need you to go and tell those not to teach any other doctrine. Sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, I've, I've, I've heard a word, oh, I've had a special word from the Lord. If it don't line up with Scripture, it wasn't the Lord. Some people say, well, I, I see visions. Well, all your visions better line up with the book or it ain't from Jesus. People say, well, I had special, uh, uh, who, uh, who was it, uh, Joseph Smith that, uh, that got the, uh, the, 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 the golden tablets, or the, or the well, they weren't gold, but the tablets, and, 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 and said that it was a special unction from God. Listen, it wasn't in Scripture. And you, and you have these folks that'll say, we'll send you a copy of God's Word. The Mormons, they'll say, they'll get on TV and say, we're going to send you a copy of the Bible. And people say, boy, that's 
that's nice. They're going to send me a Bible. They're going to send you more than the Bible. They're going to send you the Bible and the Book of Mormon that interprets the Bible as if the Holy Spirit of God can't tell you what God's Word says or that you're too dumb to know what it says. And then, and then once you get that free gift from them, they start setting up meetings with you. And you think, boy, isn't that nice? They want to come by and have a little Bible study at my house with the Bible. No, no, no. They want to get into that Book of Mormon. They want to get away from the Bible. Hey, you better be careful. You better be careful where you're learning things and where you're getting things from. If your preacher don't preach the Bible, run him off. Listen, if you sit under somebody too long and they start preaching, you know, uh, the latest fad and, and, and it's Christmas, and listen, all the latest stuff. And let, listen, get somebody that's going to preach the, the word verse by verse. Preach the Bible. So many times today we get people that they, they, they preach the latest thing. They preach the newest stuff. And, 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 and boy, the latest, all the stuff. I, I just believe that the word still saves. I believe that the same messages that was preached 350 years ago are good today. I believe the same ones in Whitfield's time in the 1700s are still strong today. I believe that God still saves people. And I believe that our hearts still yearn for what God's word has to say. How bad is this thing of biblical illiteracy? The Bible says fewer than half of all adults can name the four Gospels. Many professing Christians cannot identify more than two or three of the disciples. 60% of Americans can't even name five of the Ten Commandments. 82% of Americans believe God helps those who helps themselves is a Bible verse. It's not. 12% of it got quiet. 12% of adults believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. A survey of graduating high school seniors revealed that over 50% thought Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. A considerable number of respondents to one poll indicated that the Sermon on the Mount was preached by no less than Billy Graham. That's what people think about God's Word. And you, you, you walk around and you hear this, you, you hear people talk about it, and people just by and large don't know what it says. The Bible says in verse 4, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. Now in the end, now in the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith unfeigned from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof whether they affirm. So it's that people don't know what they're saying. You got so many people today that want to be teachers of the word that don't know the word themselves. And it's killing us. Listen, today I'm, I'm going to talk to you two or three different ways. It, it's, it's killing us. First of all, it has an effect on individuals. Because people don't know God's word. God's people have always been destroyed by lack of knowledge. Listen to me. God's people, I want you to listen to this. God's people have always been destroyed by lack of knowledge. Hosea Chapter 4, verse 1 says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. People, people, by and large, didn't know God's word way back then. That was a problem way back with the children of Israel, that they didn't know what God's word had to say. How do we know how to live if we don't know what it says? How do we know what's required? As a kid at the house, I knew there were certain things I had to do. Listen, if I had dirty clothes, they better be in the clothes hamper in the bathroom. They didn't wind up on the floor. You got a whipping. Hey, one whipping, I pick up my own clothes. I don't throw my clothes on the floor now. I'm afraid my mama might find out. And I know she's got a broke hip coming on the hospital today, but I believe she still do it. You know, but now, out of respect for the people that, that wash clothes at our house, it's so much easier to help out. Right. Are you young people in here? Don't you realize how much respect you're showing your parents whenever you help out without being told to help out? You know, we know what to do, but we don't do it. And parents don't go, yeah, yeah, yeah. The parents, you the same way. You know what God told you to do, but we don't want to do it. We know what God said. We know what's right, but we still don't want to do it. And we look at our kids and expect different from them. You know, they get that rebellious nature from you. That's hard, isn't it? That's where they get it from. And we know, we know what God tells us to do. We know what's right, but somehow or another we see it. I can remember, uh, we, I hate, man, I hate pull up to a railroad. All you that work for a railroad, bless your heart. 
Uh, I don't like railroad. Trains, tracks, trellises, nothing. I don't like any of it. Because if you come through Folkestone, Georgia, you have to stop at every train track in the world. Uh, uh, but now, if you work there, I'm proud for you. I'm glad you got a good job. But now, I don't like, I'm not a train person. Let's just put it that way. I, I, I'm just not a train person. But, but there are some people that, that truly are. Now, when I think about the, the, the train and the, and, the, and the trouble it causes me, see, it helps, it helps other people. So when I begin to think about uh, how God has, has, has shown me things in my life, he slows me down. I pull to a train track in my van. I get aggravated. So Emma, she's sitting in the back of the car. And I say, ah, trains. Well, I hate trains. So Emma's in the back in her car seat, facing the other way, not even looking at the train. She goes, ah, I hate trains. <laughs> you know, here she's fit to be 18 years old. She pulled to a train track. I hate trains. She don't even know why. You know, but we, we've patterned her, you know. We, it's not the train. It's the stopping. It's the having to wait. If milk trucks went by, I hate milk trucks. You know, and folks, it's red lights. Our red lights are the craziest things you've ever seen in your life. And, and, you know, it lets everybody fly through Folkestone, but all of us that go on a cross, you know, we have to wait forever. As well as we see all these people that spend money flying through Folkestone. And we wonder why. I hate red lights. I go around them in folks. You can do that in folks. It's funny how our kids begin to notice what we do, and, and they, they, they hate those things too. Where there's a lack of God's word, the people faint, the Bible says. Amos chapter 8 says this, Behold the day come, behold the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. In that day shall the virgins and young men faint for thirst. In ignorance, they make wrong decisions and wrong choices. When they stumble, they don't know where to go because they don't know what God's word has to say. Listen, young people today are, are living life like they want to because they don't know what God's word has to say. Parents, they have, you have a responsibility to make sure your kids know what God's word has to say. So that when they step outside God's law or God's word, they say, whoop, that's wrong. That's wrong. So they know. But today our parents congratulate them. Today, today we come along beside them and say, well, you know, it's just, just the culture. It's kind of the way things are. But without a knowledge of God's word, they don't have any real direction. Uh, Psalms 119.105 tells me that God's word is a, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I have God's word, it gives me light. It tells me direction. It shows me what way to go. My, my goal is to be right with God, whether I'm a 13-year-old or a 33-year-old. I should still want to be right with God. We don't get free uh, do-overs or mulligans because we're young in God's word. It's still sin. So it's, it's a, it's, it's, we have to know what God's Word has to say. And as individuals, as children, as, as adult leaders, we have to make sure that it has an effect on churches as well. Because if our, if our people don't know it as individuals, it's that our families aren't pushing it as hard as we ought to. You know where it starts showing up? In churches. It starts showing up in churches. Why? Because churches are languish for a lack of leaders. People just come to church. They don't lead anymore. Oh, but they'll get aggravated if things don't go the way they want to go. But, but, but if we're not careful, the, we, 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 we run out of leaders. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 says, For when the time ye ought to be teachers. I like that verse. For when the time ye ought to be teachers. Y'all get that part? For when the time ye ought to be teachers. Paul is assuming that at this time you ought to be teaching. There ought to be a place in your life when you reach a spot after a certain amount of time or a certain length of time that you should be teaching other people. Amen. You ought to be bringing God's Word and ministering it to other people. Take a minute right there. Some of us never get above just coming to church. Some of us never get above just showing up. Oh, wait, you know, and listen, all teaching isn't sitting in a classroom, by the way. Miss Janet's teaching. 
She's over here. I told her I saw somebody in uh, Minnesota yesterday. I thought it was her. Miss Janet's got a little bit different accent. I don't know if y'all know. I heard her accent yesterday and thought Janet Pitts was in the airport in Minnesota. But all teaching it isn't just teaching God's Word. It's not teaching how to live. Hey, listen, as you're, as you're going out and playing ball with these kids in the afternoons on Wednesday nights, you're teaching them. You're showing them. Hey, as you're hauling these kids different places for these things, that you're teaching them. You're showing them. As you're coming and taking up the offering, as you're standing at the doors, as you do, you're teaching, you're showing, you're, you're doing. It's not, it's not all just about those that sit and take God's Word out and teach it. That's a great thing. Not everybody's ever called to do that. Some are, some aren't. And some people don't want to ever stop. I think, I think teachers ought to have a break every now and then where they can just sit in a class and listen. But some of them would never do it. Brother Howe? Brother Howe would never do that. That's Brother Howe's calling. And I look back and I thank God for teachers. But, but, we, but our churches are, are, are languishing. First Hebrews 5.12 says, For when the time you ought to be teachers. This is, this, this is such a sad verse. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again. It means that you got to a certain place, and then somehow or another you, you, you slid way back again. You, you, you know, you got, you, you, you got, you got uh, justified, and then you got in this sanctification process that lasts your whole life, and at the very end is glorification. And you got in this sanctification process, and you learned this much, and you was about to get ready where God could really just pull. And, and you decided to slide back down the sanctification meter, if you will. And the Bible says here, instead of, instead of getting to the place you can teach, you have need that somebody teach you again. It's almost like you got to start over. Lord, help us. It's a sickness in our churches. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one should teach you again, which be the first oracles, first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Churches are led astray by false teachers and false doctrine. I mean, how can the ignorant know what's false? I mean, how can people that don't know what God's Word says know what's false? Somebody can come in and teach you some craziness. You, you go into a classroom and they got a board set up and they got all kind of sh 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 drew on there and you oh boy look at all look how smart and before you know it you're following them. We got kids that go off to college that go sit under an atheist professor and because they they look at that stuff they say oh look how smart surely they must be listen dumb as a pile of rocks if you want to ask answer any questions for me because I had an old grandpa who didn't graduate seventh grade that knew more about the love of Jesus. Hey, it's going to be in heaven one day. And listen, I got news for you too. We better understand that God is real. Hey, and, and, and listen, and he did die for us on the cross. And he did rise from the dead. And he is coming back. And we better be ready. People say, well, I just, I just, I just believe in the scientific part of it. If, if, if you believe that I started from a speck of dust, you got more faith than I got about believing there's a God. Speck of dust got a heartbeat. Isn't that something? I wonder today how many churches are just dying on the vine. You know, because there, there's no more teachers. They don't know what God's Word has to say anymore. And, but, but when the, the families and the homes start falling, the churches start falling, you know what's next? Communities. Yeah. You know what starts coming apart then is our communities. Yeah. Look at the foolishness that's happening across America now. Yeah. People say, well, it's, it's this. No, it's a lack of God's Word. Yeah. Somewhere, somebody's mom and daddy didn't sit a kid down and say, listen, if you rebel, you're not rebelling against just me. You're rebelling against the almighty God who created everything. Amen. That's what kids need to hear. That's what they need to know. That there's a great, listen, there's a greater authority out there than just mama and daddy. Our standards of morality are skewed. Where evil is good and good is evil. 15, Isaiah 520 says this, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We slaughter the innocent uh, 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 and, and, and we spare the guilty. Yeah. We do that all the time. We reward the wicked, the movie stars, the entertainers. We watch their movies. We go to the places they own to eat. Doesn't matter what they do, what they, well, they sell good food. Listen, if you'll stop eating at some of them places, they'll shut them down. Divorce is made so easy today, 
Adultery is looked upon lightly. Fornication is just an affair or a relation. Homosexuality is called an alternative lifestyle. I call it an abomination before a holy God. The effect of those things are destroying our families and our communities. I mean, you look around today. I told you, I told you a while back we talked about, you know, the, uh, uh, everything that we see in this world. That's not the fruit of people falling away. It's the, it's the, it's the result of God giving them up. What we see today in this world with everything falling, falling what we say, going to hell in a handbasket, you know, we'll say that, and we see all the ugliness. It isn't it, because people, that's what people have, that's not the fruit of their sin. That's because that's God gave them up. Right. They, don't, they don't think about God now in there. They don't relate to God anymore. They just see that as they can live however they want to live. And however they feel, whatever feels good to them, they can do. And the reason they do that, according to Romans chapter 1, is because God gave them up. God gave them up to their own, own wants, their own desires, their own fleshly lusts. They knew the truth, but they turned against the truth, so God gave them up. We say, brother, that's not nice. i tell you what. Um, I remember, gosh, it's long, long, several long time ago. Had a bunch of kids to eat one night. One of the youth's little sister wanted to go with us. She must have been six years old. I don't remember. About six years old. I said, sure, she can go. She can go. She wants to. And uh, we're sitting there eating, and the kids are yammering back until, you know, there's 70 up. Yammering, raising sand, you know. And I know there's this little girl. She's six. But she wants to be 16 because that's, you know, girl kid. She starts singing this song called Mrs. Promiscuous. Yeah, she had no idea what it meant. She had no idea that a girl by the name of Nellie Furtado in 2007 wrote that song. I looked it up. Some of y'all know it. She had no idea what it meant. She began to sing it. Everybody laughed. Her sister was ashamed of her. Got on to her. That young lady wound up having three children out of wedlock before she was 20 years old. You say, well, well bro, right? No, 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 no. These things are learned. That's right. Hey, these things are learned. I'll tell you what happened. A mama and daddy, listen to me, a mama and daddy let them have that stuff on their phones or their iPods or pads or whatever they had. They let them have the music. They let them listen to it. They said, well, that's just music. No, it's not. It's brainwashing them. It's pouring the devil into them every day when they need to hear about good things. There's a reason why when we grew up, our folks didn't let us watch Three's Company. <laughs> we had to watch Little House on the Prairie and Andy Griffith. <sighs> Listen, but it got me through, a, a, it got me through a, a stage of my life. You see, because when I was about 12, 13 years old, I had some knucklehead cousins that were older than me that wanted to show me some, some very ugly things. My mom and daddy wasn't putting up with it. And if, and if that happened to come out of our house, they beat the brakes off of me. So by the time I got about 18, I got old enough to carry some of the weight of some of that stuff. And I was old enough to say no myself. But until the time I was old enough to say no myself, my mom and daddy said it. See, I wasn't able to go to some folks' house. I didn't go to some folks' house because their daddy drank or their, mama was, or their mama was flirtatious. I didn't go to their houses. Mama didn't let me. She said, there's some place you ain't going to get to go. I told my daughter growing up, so sweet, there's a place you ain't going to get to go. You should know I'm not your friend. I'm your daddy. Amen. You know, it, 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 she don't like it. She don't like it now. But listen, I'm her daddy. Hey, I'm called. Listen, I am called... I owe it to her. I am called before God to make sure she gets this word in her heart till she gets to the place where she's strong enough or to the place in her own life where she can make her make good decisions based on something, based on maturity. It's like giving a kid Monopoly money. You can give a kid that's six years old $100,000 Monopoly money. He might go to town and try to buy candy with it. He has no idea what the value of that currency is. And our children are like that. But you, you give a little fella. I saw the other day they had a, had a kid had a big bear. And he had $10,000 bundled up. And he asked this three-year-old which one he wanted. He took the bear. He didn't have any idea about the currency and what that value was in that money. See, our young people have no idea what the value of God's word is yet. 
They have no idea what the value it's going to be in their heart when they get old enough to spend that currency. When they get old enough to say, you know what, I'm thankful for what my mom and daddy said. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for what they said is right and what's wrong. Listen, they may not like you for it, but, but they deserve God-called parents to make sure they're doing it the right way. Man, that's hard preaching. But there, there, there's, a, there's an antidote. You know, if, if it's a poison, there's an antidote for it. Daily devotionals. I, I believe we ought to be in God's Word all the time. If, if, if we want to know what God's Word has to say, get in it. You, you, ought, you ought to have your kids in a Bible study. You ought to have your kids in a Bible study. Take them to every vacation Bible school. Mamas and daddies, you need to be in a Bible study. If, you, if, if, this is, if this is the only preaching you're getting, if this is the only time the Word of God is opened in your presence, you're missing it. You need to be in God's Word regularly. If, 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 I don't want to be a biblical illiterate. I want to know what God's Word has to say. I, there's so much, man, there's so much I don't know, but there's so much more I want to know. I think you ought to have in-depth Bible study with other people. I believe that parents ought to accept their God-given responsibility um, to teach them. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 says, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Churches, I'm not talking about other churches, I'm talking about this church. See, I've been here long enough now. This church. We need to give assistance to parents that want to train their children up in the, in the Word of God. We need to make sure... And, and there's some of you out there that are teachers. There's some of you out there that are leaders. We need biblical teachers. I'm going to tell you the truth. The, the same people, this isn't, a, this isn't a salvation sermon today. This is a warning. This is a warning sermon. But I believe without a doubt that if, if we don't change, if we don't change, we're going to slide farther and farther and farther down the scale away from the things of God. That's why you hear me harp on it, be at church. Be at Sunday school. Be, be, are, are you studying God's word? Are you, are, why aren't you here? Listen, I send a text out. Listen, why aren't you? Listen, I've been, where you at, man? I, I, you know, listen, there's a reason for that. Because we need to know what God's word has to say. We need to be hearing God's word. And the less we're hearing God's word, the farther we are away from God. You say, well, you know, I, I pray on my own. Not as good. Hey, I don't believe that for nothing. Because I've been by myself praying. You know what I need? You know what I need, Brother Judge? I need other people praying around me. I don't nothing bless my heart more than anything. When Brother Johnny and a couple of fellas come in my office and pray on Sunday mornings before church. That's some of the best prayer I have all week. Other people are praying with me. That's what you, that's what you need. That's what you need. I believe that, I believe that not only parents should be uh, accepting their God-given responsibility, but I believe preachers ought to be fulfilling their, their duties to God, that preachers ought to be giving heed to God's Word. We should expect preachers to be men of the book, preaching and teaching the Word of God, providing exposition to the Scriptures. We're in an era of big, big, big. Everybody wants something big. If you get a little money scratched together, you want to build something. You get a little, how, about, how, about, how about finance a new mission group? Well, if we get a little something scratched together, next day, we want to get bigger, and bigger, how about this? Big churches, big building, big budgets, big egos. And I wrote this down. If, 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 I wrote it down. I wrote this actually down 15 years ago. And I read it this past week, Brother Ronnie. It's still true today. I'm, I'm, I'm weary of watching as time and time again the preachers that get the most spotlight are the least Christ-like. I heard the president of the GBC 15 years ago refer to his wife on stage as eye candy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like lost my mind. Preachers need to be pouring themselves over the word of God to be ready to bring it to the people of God. We have a God-given responsibility to make sure our flocks know the truth and error when they hear it. Amen. That's our responsibility. Say, well, brother, you get, you get in my business too much. I have a responsibility to be in your business. Right. You know, if, if not, there are places that you can go that, that people won't. But you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to, to, 
to expect as much out of yourself as you expect out of me. So if, if you want to hear God, if you want, if you want God's word right, get your heart right. Because you listen, you might not be able to receive God's word from me if your heart's not right when you get here. Make sure our hearts are right. In conclusion, I, 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 uh, Albert Moeller, some of y'all have heard that name, wrote an article, The Scandal of Biblical Illiteracy. I got this sermon from there 20 years ago, I guess. I, and the older I get, the more I write, and I change it, and I add to, and I do, you know. And, and, and so here I am preaching the end 15, 20 years later, and, and it means something else to me because I've, I've been saved longer, and I've been pastoring longer. And I think that the fervency of knowing what the book says is a bigger deal than it used to be. And I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or it's because we're falling farther away from the book and its oracles. I'm afraid that if we're not careful, we're going to raise the first generation that has no use for God's Word. Listen, or at least they don't want to prop up its antiquated ideas. A lot of people today would say, well, that'll never happen. Ha! Ha! I wonder if a hundred years ago they can see where we are today, what would they say? Albert Moeller said this, and I verbatim. Number one, churches must recover the centrality and urgency of biblical teaching and preaching and refuse to sideline the teaching ministry of the preacher. Pastors and churches too busy or too distracted to make biblical knowledge a central aim of ministry will produce believers who simply do not know enough to be faithful disciples. Secondly, we will not believe more than we know and we will not live higher than we believe. The many fronts of Christian compromise in this generation can be directly traced to biblical illiteracy in the pews and the absence of biblical preaching and teaching in our homes and in our churches. And the third thing he said, this generation must get deadly serious about the problem of biblical illiteracy or a frightening large number of Americans will go on thinking that Sodom and Gomorrah lived happily ever after. That's where we're at. People, people want to hear the good stories about Noah and the ark. They like hearing about David and the, you know. Boy, they like hearing about Daniel and the lion's den and, you know, the waters and the Red Sea parting. But what about those verses that tell us how to live and that, that hurt our feelings? What about those verses that tell us, hey, better get your life right? Because cause really what it boils down to is a, is a long-term um, giving ourselves away to the study and, and knowing what God's Word has to say. That's what the church is. My responsibility to you is, is to make sure I'm in it to teach it to you. That's my responsibility to you. There'll be times you don't like it, times you don't like me. But I'm accountable to God for the Word. So are you. So are each one of you. You have a responsibility as a as a mama, as a daddy, as a teenager, you have a sphere of influence. People are watching you. They know, they know you say what you believe, but do you live what you believe? Lord, help us. I believe that we repent enough to be saved. I just don't know if we surrender enough to be changed. I believe we repent enough to be saved, but we don't surrender enough ever be changed we say God I want you to save me but I really like to live the life that I live because I like it I'd really like to continue what I'm doing and doing it how I want to do it when God truly wants to show you something greater God wants to show you something beautiful Lord we love you and we thank you for your word Lord I know it's hard preaching today I know it's hard teaching and I know it's hard to hear but God raise us up a generation of people let this be the generation that seeks your face. Let this generation of people that's coming up be the one that flips the world upside down for Christ. Help us, God, to stay true in the word and to be faithful to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, please stand. If you'd like to come and pray, please do. God's moving on your heart. If you've never been saved and would like to be saved, today can be your day.
Thank God good. Thank y'all for coming today. I'll be with you tonight. Uh, I think Mama's coming home. I think Jonathan's bringing her home, maybe even even now. So thank y'all for praying for her. Uh, uh, pray for us as we put up with her. Um, she don't want to rant. She don't want none of that stuff on her house. She's not sick. She's not handicapped. She don't want nothing. So y'all pray for her and pray for us. And pray for my wife that my wife don't kill her or her kill my wife. Because <clears throat> I need both of them. So, but uh, thank y'all for praying for him. And pray for Bryant tomorrow. Pray for Bryant Heyman tomorrow. Pray for his family, people around him. Uh, pray for Morgan, Charlie. Um, pray for that household. Pray tomorrow to get some good news. And uh, just continue to pray. Anybody have anything to say before we dismiss? It's good being God's house. Good being God's house. I went to a place this past week. I was in Canada hunting this past week. And uh, killed my deer early Wednesday morning, so I was done about 2 o'clock. Spent two hours. I talked to Matt this week. I spent two hours hunting a church. Two hours. Didn't find any. I must have drove 200 miles hunting a church to go to. Wednesday night. There was none. There was none. Oh, they was there. They just weren't open. They were there. They just weren't open. They just weren't open. So... Pray for our pray for people to get to hear God's word. I thought, I could preach up here. I'm here tonight. I could preach. I was hoping I'd go to church and somebody say, hey, how about you preach? And I'd preach. I couldn't hardly wait. But pray for people that they get to hear God's word. Yeah. Anybody before we go? Brother Ronnie, would you dismiss us, please?